meeting is being recorded. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Social Housing Roundtable. I've lost count of the number that we're on now. So, um, yeah, welcome to 6th of July. Um, today was a really interesting one. I spoke to Dan a little while ago um, about website design, inclusivity, and a whole range of other things. And, and when we got to talking, it became very clear that the best thing we could do was run a roundtable on it. So I'll pass over to Dan in a minute to kind of do introductions. But to anyone who I've not liaised with before, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, my name's Matthew Baird. I've been running a social housing recruitment business now, my own one for about a year and a half, but I've been doing it for 10 and a half years, which is scary when you start to realise numbers adding up, particularly some of that was during COVID, which was, I'll tell you what, no one was hiring during that time, but that's by the by. Um, I saw some of you as well at last week's uh, CIH conference, so it's good to see you there, especially Thomas, nice to see you with us. The reason, as I say, for today, one of the big things that I'm trying to do is with these roundtables is create change. It's to drive people to actually go, what can we change that isn't necessarily a massive thing, but that will actually improve the sector? And, and as I say, when I started speaking to Dan and recite me, it was definitely, a, you, you can get that from today and I hope everyone could take something away. But equally, I want this to be very much a roundtable discussing how we engage with tenants, how we're listening to complaints and what barriers there might be to people coming through. So on that, I'm going to pass across to Dan to introduce yourself. Dan, good to have you with us today. Uh, thanks, Matt. It's it's lovely to be here. Um, I, as Matt alluded to when we spoke, I think we met on another event and it was probably one of the other infinite Zooms that we've all been on for the last <laughs> couple of years. Um, and Matt's kind of invited me on to kind of have a chat about about what we do, um, specifically in, in, in you know the housing industry, but in general as well. So... I'm part of the, the sales team here. Uh, I refer to myself, I think, as an accessibility specialist. Um, and what we look to do is improve the accessibility on people's websites, not just websites, but things like customer portals, intranets, you know, anywhere that's accessed through a browser by anyone who might need additional assistance. What now, I will quickly say, Dan, just on that, is if anybody has a question at any time, feel free to use the chat function. Feel free to use the reaction to the bottom and just raise hand or lower hand. I will bring people into the conversation. Perfect. So feel free to dive in there, but I'll manage that side. All right, I'm pass back to you. Yeah, I'd encourage that, guys. You know, nothing worse than listening to someone kind of waffle for a few minutes. I much prefer these to be a, a two-way thing. Um, but what I'm going to kind of take you through today is a little bit of an introduction to RecyteMe, but also an introduction to website accessibility in general. Some of you will have looked into it in detail before some of you it might be a bit, very fresh idea uh, it's something that i'm introducing for the first time now where recite me comes in is we look to assist those who need as i said additional assistance whether that's through you know things like site based disability whether someone's neurodiverse whether that's dyslexia autism early syndrome whatever it might be or even if someone has english as a second language because as we'll see in a second, it's quite a large proportion of the UK population, and that's increasing all the time because we're, we're becoming a wonderfully diverse country. And, you know, there's lots of different language uh, requirements uh, from, you know, end users of the websites that you guys are in control of. So, Matt, if it's OK with you, I'll just share my screen just so I've got some supporting slides. Now, I'll apologise now, guys. I am not a PowerPoint expert by any stretch of the imagination. So if it's slightly less slick than it could be, I, I can only apologize. But as I said, from Recite Me, we've been doing this for about 15 years now, helping organizations in all sectors from the likes of, you know, British Gas, Tesco, Denelm, all the way through local authorities, NHS, all the way down to one man band charities who are putting out information for, for people who need it. Any website can be made more accessible. And any web site can be made more inclusive. And that's a word I'm going to come back to. So a few stats for you there, because this, when I first came to Recite Me, is one of the most eye-opening things for me. How many people here in the UK need support online? You know, 14.1 million people with some form of disability and 15% of residents who are neurodiverse. I think the stats fluctuate every year that a bit of research is done, but we usually work on, on the figures of 20% of the UK population, so one-fifth. Um, and that can, like I say, visual impairment, some form of neurodiversity, whatever it might be. On top of that, you've got 10% of the UK who don't speak English as their first language. I think that's a little bit out of date now. I think we're close to 12 or 15%. And then, of course, you've got 11.8 million residents who are 65 and over. And that comes with, you know, sight disabilities, macular degeneration, something that runs, runs in my family and I've seen firsthand. And all of this can have such an effect on the way they come to your website and consume the content. 
for them, the experience is going to be different to the other 80%. So why should you ensure accessibility for all? There's a few different reasons. One can be revenue. You know, I mentioned there, British Gas, Tesco, some big commercial clients. It's, it's a smart thing to do from a, from a revenue point of view. It can also be the smart thing uh, for things like, you know, feedback from, from your tenants. Uh, you know, we, we all like a good Google review. It can be a smart thing to do to help boost your reputation as, as an organization. Uh, it can be the right thing to do, you know, improving user experience. We want to make things easier for everyone. We want to make sure that everyone is having the best experience. And then you've got the things you must do. You know, there's all kinds of compliance and legalities. Even in the couple of years I've been here at Site.me, we've seen more and more legislation come in that says your website has to be accessible. It has to be inclusive. It has to be able to, you know, offer the same experience to everyone. And then there's the final bit there that says, are you ready to embrace accessibility? You know, yes, there's financial, ethical, legal advantages, but the feel-good factor, and we've got some quotes that I'll come to later, later, later on, but, you know, it, it's, it's always wonderful for us to have one of our end users come back and say, this has been a wonderful experience. And we had one last week from someone who's gone through a recruitment process with one of our clients. And she said it was wonderful. And now she's got a dream job, which she couldn't have gotten if Recycling wasn't there to assist her. So it's, I, I can tell you firsthand, it's, it's a lovely thing to hear. So we look at what you can do. Now, the first one is WCAG 2.1. These are the guidelines for a website. This is what's laid out in black and white the responsibility of the website owner. Part of that is that second part there, checking your content, ensuring things like alt text is present, you know, contrast ratios are correct, ongoing compliance of your website to make sure that it's reaching the standards, whether that's A rated, double A rated, triple A rated, making sure that every time your content is added, you maintain your accessibility levels. You can also check your own documents. You know, Microsoft Office, again, in the last couple of years, has gotten so good at making you know, accessibility a big thing for those uh, who are affected by disabilities. And then the last thing on, online there is adding software to the site. That's where we come in. So even the most accessible sites, uh, a AAA rated website won't suit everyone. So that's where Recite Me comes in there. What you're seeing there are the tools that make up our toolbar. And what I'm gonna do, and again, this isn't gonna be particularly slick, but ta-da. I've uh, kind of hijacked one of our clients here, Network Homes. It's just the first one on the list, quite, quite frankly, but I know their website works uh, particularly well and, and I, can, I can definitely trust it. So you'll see there at the top of the screen, there is a button that says accessibility and has the recycling logo. It, it, it doesn't always look like that. You know, all our clients get to choose their own buttons. It can be a big button that says accessibility. It can be the commonly accepted accessibility symbol, which is the little guy with his hands and legs out that you might've seen, but they all do the same thing. If I hit that button, what will happen is the Recite Me toolbar will launch. So, as I said, range of tools that can be used by anyone in any combination. What we're going to do is just have a very brief run through. Um, there'll be all kinds of uh, follow-up information from this. Matt's got our recent housing report, which he's going to share after, after uh, everything. And it's got loads of examples. It goes in way more detail than we've got time to do now. So the first symbols that you see on the left there are the text-to-speech. Text-to-speech is a wonderful tool if you have a site-based disability, it, but if you're neurodiverse, maybe you prefer just have the text read out to you. Again, it's all personal preference. So if I just hover over the text there, you can see it highlights and it reads it out to you. Dead simple. Can I ask a quick question there? Uh, of course you can, Thomas. So on that, so again, we one of, one of the products we do is actually creating websites for, for social housing. Yes. Um, and I just want to see, so your, your toolbar is fantastic, right? We, we have our own, but I think there's a huge opportunity for us to to maybe talk together going forward and potentially work together because yours looks a little bit more comprehensive, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to know is, will depending on the silk tide score, if, if the website isn't set out correctly with, you know, the right headings and the right mm -hmm. gaps and everything, how does that affect the toolbar itself? That does the website have to, you know, silk tide pick up those errors? Will your solution pick those errors up, or will it find a fix for those errors? It, a lot of it can depend on, you know, different CMS uh, and, and, you know, the different builds that have gone on. Nine times out of 10, the toolbar will find a way to do it. Um, and, but we do also have a, a different product, which I'm not going to uh, introduce you to just yet because it's still just coming out of beta and it's just about being launched. But we've got our website scanning tool as well, which is the WCAG stuff, which is the, the contrast ratios. You know, you can, you can scan your website and it will tell you exactly what changes need to be made. Fantastic. You know, we work across some AAA rated websites. We work across some 
not so brilliant websites, not naming names of, of who's who. Um, but yeah, the, the toolbar has been made to, to adapt in the best possible way to what's on the screen. Things I'm not like, sure, Dan, whether your um, media there, when, when we went to share, whether or not it was playing the sound, because we didn't hear the sound uh, actually reading out, but I know it does read it out. And it do, it's because I'm using headphones, because um, yeah. I'm a little bit hard of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to trust me and go and look for yourselves, guys. It yeah, read, it but I know, I know it here works <laughs> No, that, that's a great answer to the question. Thank you, mate. So it, it's, no uh, you've, you've got quite a few things and more in, in, in the pipeline. So thank you. Yes. Cool. And something you said there, Thomas, you know, you mentioned there too about we're not quite as many tools. That's still better than having no tools. You know, it, it might sound ridiculous for us to say an alternative is a good thing. It, it's, uh, you know, it, it shows that you guys are actually thinking about accessibility and that's the main thing. And it shows that there are some tools to affect. I think we're the most comprehensive one out there. And that's because we've been doing this for 15 years now. You know, we started because our our uh, CEO is dyslexic. He can't deal with, as you're saying here, black text on a white background. It, it, it doesn't work for him. It's really tricky to read. I suppose that takes us on the next part of, uh, of the, the demonstration, to be honest, the visuals. So if I were Ross or CEO, I'd have the page set up like this. Yellow background, black text. This is quite common with those who are dyslexic. You know, yellow background, black text is a commonly accepted solution um to, to help to help when it comes to reading the content and you know if i were us this would be great we can't have a big button that says if you're dyslexic press here it would be wonderful if we could but it affects everyone differently so chris on my team for example uses pastel colors we've got one of the guys in our dev team who's also dyslexic he uses grayscale so we've got the 20 most prevalent i think you would say cool combinations there and that's based on research We've done experts in the field, uh, experts that we partner with, uh, who always give us end user feedback as well. These will help the majority of those who are neurodiverse, but they won't help everyone. So I can essentially go into the color wheel and find, you know, this particularly fetching shade of red might be what I know works for me, not, not just because it matches our branding, that's a happy accident. And then it could be that white text on that background is what works for me. And then once we looked at the colors, we can actually look at the text itself. You know, I mentioned dyslexia there, Open Dyslexia is a font that's been designed a few years ago. All the letters are bottom heavy. It weights the text, it anchors it, it holds it in place, stops the words whizzing all over the place. But again, it doesn't work for everyone. I know quite a few people will use Vedana because it's a very neutral font with very uniform letter spacing, letter sizing. And we can even affect the line height, the character spacing, even the size of the text itself. We've essentially got full control over how it's displayed and it's down to the end user to pick what works best for them. Is that all making sense so far, guys? I can see nods, I can see thumbs up, perfect. So those are two of the main things we do. The third is languages. And one thing I found when I'm talking to housing associations, you know, a couple of recent ones, Catalyst, um, have come on board and about to go live. They said for them, because they've got such a diverse target audience, there are so many languages there, languages are a huge thing. Even if someone speaks fluent English and reads fluent English, it's always quicker, easier, more comfortable to read in the native language. So if I click this button here, you'll see we've got over 120, I think, languages currently that we can translate the content into. So if I just use Polish, there's in front of me. Click the button, everything will change accordingly. Do you, you have Welsh? Thing is, is it wasn't just a, um, I think one of the things, Dan, when we discussed this previously, mm -hmm. was it wasn't just Google Translate, was it? It's actually yeah. designed to be readable rather than just being, you know, translate word for word. Exactly that. So what's happening is the HTML output, the words on the page are being picked up by our system, passed through our API. It's machine learning. We'll do a few clever things that I don't fully understand in the system, but I'm sure they're very clever. And what happens is the main thing was we translate by full body of text. So what you're seeing you know, here, for example, is a paragraph translated as paragraph. Things like sentence structure, grammar, syntax are a lot more accurately translated. It'll never be as accurate as a fully human translated bit of content. It, it just can't be, but it's as good as machine learning gets. Um, Thomas, I think I heard you ask about Welsh. We absolutely yes. do. So if I just scroll down, Welsh, that's the rug. There it is. All that's fantastic. Corner. Absolutely fantastic, mate. I, I love how it just it keeps the format of everything because, you know, the, some of the old school systems will actually change it to just mm -hmm. a whole lot of text. Um, the fact that it keeps the format and that look of feel. It's, um, yeah, that's, that's really... It's, it's some, of the, some, <laughs> some of the old school systems uh, work very much like some screen readers do where they will read the code behind the website we read the HTML. So what we're picking up is literally the outputs, the text on the page. I think that's one of the things, same with the text-to-speech functionality, that's how it works. Because it's embedded in the website, it's JavaScript code, that's why it's so much more reliable. So your text-to-speech, um, is that 
uh, to complement or to replace the screen reader, or is it just? So it, whatever the preference of the end user is, we're aware that some people have their own screen reader and recite me's designed not to interfere with that. One thing I would say is we, one thing we always come up against is the assumption that because someone needs a screen reader, they have a screen reader. It, it's not always the case as, as you'll know, you know, the most popular one is JAWS and JAWS is actually a pretty good system. I've used it a few times. It works really well, but it also costs 800 pounds for a license for a device. And every website will interact slightly differently because like I say, it has to interact with so many different CMS types and it's not embedded within. And then if you then pick up your phone and try and access the website, it doesn't work. So the idea of rep recite me is to put the onus back on the website. So if someone's accessing through various different browsers through their laptop, their tablet, their phone, recite me is always there. It's always providing support. Now where the translation gets a little bit clever as well is when you see this symbol. So conscious that it's not playing the media as it should because I've got my headphones in. But if I now hover over that text, it will play to me in Welsh. And that's wonderful. Just because we translate the content doesn't mean that that's enough. Someone could need Welsh as their language, but also be neurodiverse, also have a sight-based disability, also have things that affect their literacy and reading ability. So having the ability to have it read out in their own language is massive. Now, there's a million and one things the toolbar can do, but I'm going to stop there. I'll be Like I say... I'm going to send, we'll be sending out a few links. There's a few uh, examples in the report that Matt's going to kindly send out for us. Even things like, you know, the, the ruler, the screen mask, something you mentioned there, Thomas, you know, stripping back uh, to just pure text, that can be really useful. So if someone's got macular degeneration, for example, strip away the images, overlay the screen mask, everything's now within my field of vision. Hopefully that all makes sense. So let me just go back to PowerPoint. There we go. Again, one of my slick transitions. So we've seen there how the toolbar works and we've seen there who needs to use it. These are the numbers that normally, well, they blow me away and this is normally when it gets people's attention. So these are the last 12 months platform usage data across all of our clients. So 25 million accessible pages on websites viewed. I think that's over about five five thousand 5,000 websites that we're integrated with at the moment. 4.2 million end users and 80 million features used. And there at the bottom, you can see the breakdown. Now this is, you know, stats that we pull together and provide our clients and on a kind of 12 month growing basis, we pull together the numbers, but there you can see, you know, that's huge numbers. We are helping a lot of people. And again, just some, just some of the, the, the logos that we have in, in the housing world. One thing that I was just discussing with Matt, I've actually found out this morning is we just agreed to deal with National Housing Federation. So they're going to be using us. I think it's launching in the next two weeks. And it's good. Well, it's going to be announced in the next two weeks. So this is a bit of breaking news. Um, but I thought it was relevant to the conversation that, that we're having. Um, you will see it on the website. Give it a couple of weeks and it'll be live. And one of the things I just want to share before I, I stop uh, kind of rattling through the, the presentation, it's always good to hear, you know, from not just the clients, which you're seeing here, but everyone who's using the site. So these guys squared housing, formerly Luton Community Housing. This is from their chief exec, and it's just a little bit about their experiences so far. And the report that we're going to be sending out has a big article from Linda, and it's, it goes into a little bit more detail. I always like to share this one, not even just when I'm doing you know things to do with housing. housing. This is a customer, Anda, from uh, Beyond Housing, who's one of our clients. She's from Latvia, and as you can see, she's part of an Eastern European community support group. And this is the kind of thing, you know, when I said, it, you know, the right thing to do, the smart thing to do, opening up to accessibility and, you know, it being a really good feel-good thing. You can see that having this, uh, this, this end user come back to us and say, this is such a good experience. I couldn't have done this, neither could the people I know without Recite Me being on the website. This is what we're aiming for. This is the kind of feedback that, that we like to get because we know that we're helping people. We can see all the stats, we can see all the numbers, but these are the things that make us happy with what we do. So, I'm going to kick it over to questions. I'm also going to leave that on the screen for a second. If you want to have a chat about Recite Me for your own sites, cool, let's have a chat. Even if we get off this webinar, and as is the case, I do it all the time, there's a million and one questions we either didn't get to or only come to you after we've logged off, drop me an email, drop me a call. I talk about this day in, day out, and it's what I love talking about, so I'm more than happy to, to have a conversation. I think what I want to say, Dan, is first, like, like, look, thank you very much for coming on today. I think it was one of the important things because we, we got the conversation flowing, and... I think what I guess my opening question to you um, would be why, and this is, I think, you know, when we were talking about this before, you know, when we put this together, we were very aware. The last thing we wanted this to be was like a massive sales pitch. That's obviously not what we do with the roundtables, but we wanted yes. to make it clear as to why 
this is important. Mm -hmm. Where do you think people or businesses at the moment go wrong when they're trying to, and this is no plug for recycling, but in terms of trying to make things more inclusive for their tenants, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with their website, we see it all the time that tenant voices are, are bigger and bigger at the moment. Where, where are people going wrong? Where do you think that the minute the, the big gaps are being missed? I think one of the big ones is, is lack of awareness. Um, you know, people are aware that DNI is a huge thing and a lot of it is time consuming. You know, we're aware that we're a small cog in a very big machine. You've got things like sex, gender, race, religion. Even when it comes to accessibility for disabilities, you know, the, the whole physical aspect, you know, making sure that your buildings are, are, are correctly set up and, and all that good stuff. I think they're institutional and a lot of the time it is time consuming. And I think one of the big things we come across is the amount of time that discussions need to take. And we get somewhat lost in that. You know, recite me, for, just so you're aware, it's, it's a few lines of JavaScript or a plugin for different types of websites. Sometimes people are live within 10 minutes to an hour. And yet, then you're instantly helping, you know, the people with, with your online experience. One of the big things is grouping everything together when it comes to DNI, rather than, you know, separating the different parts and, and treating it as separate. It's treated as one big project, I think, which can slow things down because rightly some things do take a lot more time i think one of the big things as well is like i say that lack of awareness i had no idea about some of these things um you, you know were available before i came to work at recite me i'm i'm neurotypical i i don't have a site based disability um I, I i do have early onset macular generation which will affect me later in life but it doesn't yet so it's that it's that awareness piece I think is one of the big ones. Does, does that answer your, your question? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. And I think it's, it's that piece I feel is really important because we talk all the time and I've run a number of round tables, which actually a number of the people around the table today have been on. That if we talked about diversity, we've talked about inclusion, we've talked about the nine protected characteristics, mm. websites don't come up. And yet we've mm -hmm. talked about accessibility in terms of when people want to make complaints and things along those lines. How... I don't know if you've got any stats in it, but what percentage do you feel people are now accessing complaints websites, those kind of things through mobile devices rather than simply through, you know, a desktop? Because I think that's been the other mm -hmm. side. Desktop quite often these are very easy. And I haven't yes. looked on looked on this with a, with a mobile device, but I imagine that's a huge difference as well. Mm -hmm. Hugely. It, it's, it's seen such a shift. Um, you know, I live in my mobile phone, much to the detriment of... You know, my, my other half constantly tells me I'm on my phone too much, but it's because the world is now more accessible through the palm of our hand. And we've seen such a shift towards not just mobiles, but also tablets as well. Um, and that's one of the reasons we make sure it is available through all those devices. I think one thing you said there might as well, you know, complaints and things. One of the big things I run up, kind of linking back to your first question. One of the big things that I often come across is, you know, people say, well, we never have any complaints about this. And it's okay, where's your complaints section on our website? The website that isn't accessible and people can't access well maybe that's maybe that could be the problem a hundred percent we've <laughs> we've done around here on that and i think that is such a big thing uh we've just put uh just a message there in the chat from yasmin yes. said autistic people are very visually aware are there products being developed for this purpose uh possibly based on pex pcs PCS. I'm gonna, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm bad on abbreviations. Sorry, I'm... sorry. I wasn't being clever. I could have cut the whole thing out. No, right. and, and look, right. Sorry. Hi, everyone. It's the Picture Exchange Communication System and is actually internationally used. Mm. Picture Exchange Communication System. I, I personally don't. I, it's, you learn it's not... something new every day. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Yasme, I'm more than happy to hear a little bit more about that. It's not something I've actually come across. So my son's got a language program at the moment. He's 19 and they're trying to kind of, he's autistic, nonverbal. Obviously his learning development, everything's like probably the level of an eight, nine year old, if anything. Yes. So he, he's got like a, he's got a, he's got like a speech program at the moment mm -hmm. and it uses PECs. And I kind of, I kind of, I kind of factor that into when I want him to make choices independently as well. Mm -hmm. So I show him pictures so he can tell me what's his preference and like what isn't. So it was just it was just a little bit of a, a pie in the sky type of a mm -hmm. thought that came to me that, you know, whilst that, you know, you can attract people through languages. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting, the point that you made about complaints. Oh, we don't get complaints about this. I'm at Southern Housing at the moment. They've just done a really, really interesting project a couple of weeks ago to look at why the complaints that were coming in from BAME residents mm -hmm. and they house a lot of BAME residents. Southern Housing have a large housing stock in Tower Hamlets. 
Um, so they were just curious to see that, you know, why was that percentage so low? Mm -hmm. So they're like kind of re-engineering their website and everything at the moment. So today's been really ultra interesting for me. But I'm just curious to know that where you've got like the recite and it will help people with like maybe like dyslexia, you know, mm -hmm. help them to read things a lot better. You know, there's, I mean, while you were talking, I was checking my own company's website to see what the language transliteration looked like on that as well. And mm -hmm. it is actually really good. It's quite accessible. Um, I was just wondering, is there anything, any product or anything being developed for um, autistic um, people? When it comes to, so PEX, there will be, I can guarantee. One thing that we've seen in the last two and a half years is a, a massive awakening. You know, mm -hmm. P organizations now now use us that didn't before like british gas for example because you know when covid hit and the world shut down overnight so did call centers and everyone was driven online and suddenly mm -hmm. online information was the information it was it was mm -hmm. the only place to get your information and we've seen over the last two and a half years the amount of research that's going into you know neurodiversity and, and the effects is it, it's it's doubled tripled it's exponential so there, there will be something being developed. It could even be on our roadmap. You know, we've got things like the dictionary, uh, but mm -hmm. which, you know, if someone highlights a word, it opens the dictionary and it's got, you know, they'll tell them the the, the definition. It, it's really good at say in the NHS if there's some really tricky terminology because there can be, it's NHS. Uh, I wouldn't understand half of what's going on in their, in their reports, but it, 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 it could always be, it could already be on our roadmap and I, I wouldn't know that the dev team have got a very long list, shall we say. Um, okay. But that I, I would, I would, I would bet there is, there, there must be, because of the amount of research that's going on and the amount of mm -hmm. development going into that, that sector, which we've seen uh, over the last the couple of years. The important thing with the round table such as this, Yasmin, is we're having that conversation. So mm -hmm. that's absolutely brilliant. I appreciate you bringing it up because it's something I wasn't aware of and the more we can learn, the absolute better. Thomas, I'm going to bring you in and then I'm going down to, to Natalie Rose. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Dan, that was a great presentation. Well done, and, and thank you very thank much. You. Um, as I say, we, we do quite a lot. We actually do websites uh, for social housing and for, for NHS, so we know accessibility is very, very huge. Um, but you picked on some really, really good topics, and you've got some really good good points in there. But we we're talking about, you know, maybe the low engagement side. We also, we, we're talking, every social housing organisation is trying to mm. drive resident engagement. Um, and, and transparency. And I think by using an accessibility tool, you're giving people the opportunity to have that. So mm -hmm. when you launch a, a system like yours, so for the people in the rooms, so they say, wow, this is a fantastic product. Dan, I want to talk to you because I, I believe it is a great product. Um, what is your, how do you encourage the tenant engagement side? Because it's all great saying we have this new accessibility tool, but how do you get that? How do you help support the HAs themselves are saying, right, well, especially I think, um, uh, as you said, that we um, were looking at they're not even getting complaints from a mm -hmm. certain minority group. So it's include the diversity portfolio and culture and everything. Yes. How would you drive that communication outward to create that two-way path back? So we help from a marketing point of view. Uh, I think marketing is such an important tool uh, for driving awareness. Yeah. So the first step is, you know, I mentioned that the stats reporting, we pull that together for all of our clients based on how many people are using it on a monthly basis? What are they using? Is it the translations? Is it the, the text speech? Is it the, the color changes, the, the appearance of the website? We, are, we find the people who have the best stats and engagement are the ones who drive awareness from the off. So once someone signs up Recite Me, they're introduced to our marketing team. They've got an internal awareness pack. Everyone within the organization needs to be aware of what it is, why it's there, how it works, but also external awareness. We tell you what to shout about, what kind of topics to cover, where to put it, what to put in your socials. We'll That's... do some shared content. You know, we'll support, we'll support our clients on that. And then it starts to, I suppose, flip. So once you've got this, once you've driven awareness, once you're driving people, then you can start actually looking at the people using the toolbar and then vice versa, the people using the website. We've got a lovely case study from one of our NHS clients where they had no idea they had such a large, I think it was Danish population, until they looked at their stats and reporting and they saw all these, all these translations going on. So then they marketed to those people directly. They engaged with that group directly and suddenly they've identified and engaged with a demographic they had no idea existed. So it's, it's kind of like Catch-22. You don't know who you're going to help uh, with the tools until you put the tools on and figure out who you're helping. But, Absolutely. You know, yeah, we see right. that a lot with, with portals and driving engagement to portals. You know, you, you, you're never going to get 100% engagement, but you, you're going to get a lot of people who you've got to drive that engagement and i think that's a huge thing especially with the new housing bill being launched so just just with your your tool itself so 
Yes. We, we run our own CMS in, in Azure and we create self-service portals and business mm -hmm. process automation for onboarding and all that kind of stuff. So would your tool work within our CMS? So if we mm -hmm. create a website or a self-service portal or even a, an integrated work hub for one of our housing association clients, and we have our own accessibility, but could we replace ours with it's yours? Basically, it's plugin, isn't it, Dan? It's just, yeah, yeah, I was going to see, would it work with yeah. any any specific, is there any integration that it doesn't particularly work well with? I'm just thinking, again, do some of the housing people in the room, do they use Dynamics, or do they use Civica, or do they use Capita, you know, or do they use Orchard? Will this tool, is it, is it, is it a one-plug fits all, or would you need to create additional integration bits? There's there's different solutions. So things like WordPress is obviously a plugin because WordPress is a, is a plugin based website we send over you plug it in in the most complicated integrations eight or nine lines of javascript we send that over you copy and paste that into the universal template at the website or portal wherever it might be um things like umbrac or drupal for example the one the ones you kind of listed there um there will be some that we haven't seen or done before but what we always say well let's do you know a two-week technical trial um just you know for the bond that always comes to mind is dunelm they originally went with us on their career site but then it's kind of expanded from there. So we're on their careers website, which will just be a WordPress or a Drupal or something like that. We're then on their applicant tracking system. And we're across loads of them. We have partnerships with some, uh, like ePoy, for example, uh, because accessibility and recruitment is one of the biggest things at the moment. You know, it's one of our biggest sectors because that removing unconscious bias from your recruitment processes is a huge thing. But then they'll also use us on their SharePoint and also on their portal. Um, it's... We've done that many integrations. It's probably something we've seen before. I, th I think is the way we normally say it. If it's something we haven't, let's do a test. Let's see. Let's see how it works. And nine times out of ten, it'll be absolutely fine. Brilliant, Dan. Thank you, uh, Natalie Rose. I saw you raised your hand. Would you like to come in? Was there a point you want to bring in? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> not a problem at all. Uh, maybe popped off, and I'll, I'll I'll grab you when you're back. Um, I mean, for me, Dan, I know when we were first discussing this and when I was, when I was raising this topic with um, you know, people who were looking to attend today, mm. I think one of the key questions that kept coming up, um, and I guess it ties in a bit into what Thomas mentioned there, which was the, which was the outgoing marketing, but have you found that this, this is, I guess, when, when tenants are suddenly seeing products like this on their website, are you immediately improving engagement because they're suddenly feeling actually they're listening? Can be, yeah, absolutely. One, one of the things we need to do, make sure of as well, is uniformity and familiarity. So it doesn't matter where you see recycling, it will always look the same. The launch might be slightly different because that's down to you guys and your website and how you want it to look. We just say make it obvious. But actually recycling will always look the same. So if someone comes to your website and launches this if they've already been to british gas and used it to help pay their energy bills or they've used it to you know go to boots and do it do a spot of shopping that it will be that familiarity so yes there's that element of you know oh okay someone's actually reaching out I, i'm, I'm going to use this tool because now i feel included but there's also that oh i recognize this because we're you know it, it, it's it, it's it's something that is across so many websites we hope that they'll have seen it before. If not, there is always the user guide, which is just one button, one button to click on the, the toolbar. Or as part of that marketing, you can have all of the, the how-to guides. We've got nice voiceover videos that one of our co colleagues over in the US has done for us, which is a how-to run through. Embed that YouTube video in your site. Uh, you know, that's all available to you as part of the marketing support. And it's all about I helping I just think people. it's so important we've been having these conversations. I think this is the thing. It's It's another area that until people, I think you mentioned earlier, until people talk about it, you don't know it exists. Yeah. Karen, I'm going to bring you in. Thanks, Matt. Sorry, you just took me a second to work out how to That's unmute right. myself. That's right. We haven't yet had a your on mute. And I thought we might have had the first one there. Not quite. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dan. It's been really interesting. I, I, I looked at Recite a few years ago and I, I can see how much it's changed. In it the last have, yeah. couple, yeah, it's totally developed. You know, it's so different to, to you know how it used to be. It's much more sophisticated now. But um, I work for Positive About Inclusion. We're an ADNI consultancy, yeah. so we support housing organisations to make their whole services more accessible. You know, of which the website obviously is a really key part, and it, and it, and it is you know a growing part because of the mm. for the reasons you've described. My question was was whether. When you're supporting these organisations to introduce Recite, mm. do, do you help them in terms of, of what the website itself looks like? Because 
sometimes it's the the, the words used, mm -hmm. the imagery that's being used, um, that that makes the website feel not that accessible mm -hmm. rather than just needing an, uh, this additional tool to aid accessibility so mm -hmm. what what kind of support do you offer there so when it comes to direct support i suppose the answer at the moment is is not directly mm -hmm. but we have that many so organizations organizations like yourselves you know dni consultancies who mm -hmm are experts on that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We've got loads of partnerships in place and our marketing team is always putting stuff all over our website, which is exactly those topics. You know, the things that maybe aren't directly what Recite Me does, but the things that go in tandem with that and, you know, what, what people in the industry are saying, what best advice, what best practices. You know, we've got a blog post from... I'm relatively sure they've been listening, if not to a recording. They're a wonderful, overworked uh, department. Um, but they, they are constantly, you know, they, they've always got the, the fingers on the pulse of what's happening in the industry. And those partnerships that we have with, you know, DNI consultancies, they're constantly in the to us and we're constantly making sure we're in that world of, you know, what else can be done other than just just recite and like i say that that scanning tool can help from a, a build point of view you know and the technicalities that help you meet good standards um like i say watch this space it, it's been announced to us last week and it'll be getting announced soon and that's going to be just another arm which i suppose will do some of what you're describing there karen when it comes to the actual you know the way the website's put together it'll always be you know on the responsibility of the website owner. I think that's important to say the website owner for a reason owns the website and is responsible yeah. for that. But, you know, organizations like yourselves are always putting out, you know, best advice. And I think yeah. it's what important. Do you find, Karen, what do you find as some of the language terms or the language, you know, just in terms of, like I said, I want this to be very kind of inclusive, uh, ironically, uh, inclusive kind of conversation today. What are you finding are the barriers that some people find when, when trying to engage with the website? I think sometimes, Matt, it's 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 not so much of a barrier, but this, it's more of an encouragement. So Dan mentioned recruitment being a, a, a key part of the website. And obviously the clients that we work with, recruitment is a, is a big priority for them at the minute. And sometimes the way that the, the website area for recruitment is set up, there's just small little tweaks that could be made that would make that area much more attractive. So even having a few case studies, a few real stories from people who work at that organization to see what their experience has been like, they, they land really well, rather than just a paragraph of text saying, we're a really great company to work for, and they absolutely are, but having those testimonials, if you like, from a couple of, of the current employees, just make that space, just bring it to life, make it a lot more interactive and a lot more attractive. So sometimes it's just small things, small changes like that, that can make a really big difference. I agree completely. And I mean, obviously that my, my main arm of what I do, I know most people just think I spend all my time doing these, which I'd love to do, but my main arm is recruitment. It's as I mentioned at the beginning, it's what I've done for, for 10 and a half years. And I couldn't agree with you more there. I'm speaking to a lot of businesses about their branding and about sticking on a LinkedIn and how that stuff looks. But if your recruitment isn't accessible, and by that, for some people, just getting a CV together is a huge mammoth task. And then they go onto a website and they've got to fill in an application form. And immediately it's, no, not doing that. It's, I, I don't want to do more than that. And, uh, and actually, I, I struggle to do more than that. And so you're losing access to so many people. And I, I really, really value what you've put there because it's, it's imperative right now that we're being as inclusive as we can because there is a talent shortage right across right across the sector. And some of the organisations we've worked with recently, Matt, have have done their recruitment a little bit differently. So they might have have, have said to to potential candidates, just record us a video on your phone send us a video on your phone of, of who you are and what you like and what your skills are and what your experience is. And they've found that they've been able to get capture some fantastic people that just would not have been able to go through the process you've described there of do, creating a CV or, you know, uploading that to a, a portal or filling in loads of details that, you know, that that's not where their skills lie, but they're fantastic skills that they have. So sometimes just doing things a little bit differently gives you a, you know, a fantastic result. Couldn't, it's, a, couldn't it's, a fle it's a flexibility isn't it you know we're not robots we're all individuals not it's not one size suits all if if we wanted the same candidate for the same job time after time then fine that might work but as you say there it's about making sure there's different ways to to go through the processes for different people it's we attend um one of our partners is in-house recruitment live 
and we're always attending their events. I think that was one of the latest ones at the at the London events. You know, the whole application processes. I think was a big piece on that. One of our our partners, uh, Joel Major, who y- y- you might know, Karen. She she's uh, she runs a company called Diversity in in Recruitment, and she basically does exactly that. She advises people on you know best practices for for getting a, a more diverse candidate base and therefore a more diverse you know employee base. Um, it's it's a fascinating topic at the moment. It really is. It really, really is. Natalie Rose, I know you're back, so I'm going to bring you in. Please Sorry do come about in. that. That's Sorry okay. about that. Huh? Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Um, for myself, I am a personal advocate of Recycle Me. Reason being is I use Recycle Me at a previous role, which was a domestic abuse charity. Um, and we saw like a change in the way survivors of domestic abuse actually used our website once we had the Recite Me plugin. Why is this relevant for social housing is recently I had a conversation with a gentleman um, that works with a social housing provider and he was just like, how do I actually speak to our tenants and ask them to go onto our website and view details if some of them are actually struggling with translation stuff they some of them can barely speak English but we want to treat them the same way as everybody um, and for me one of the things um, is with the Recite Me plugin that we utilize it allowed everybody to be on the same level plane in the sense that a person could actually listen back to the website in their own language. Um, We actually used it as a learning tool for people to actually learn how to speak English by learning, listening to the website in English so they could actually take it on. Um, Karen, going back to one of the things that you were saying um, in terms of, is there something that can be done in terms of organization, just adding a certain personalization and I think a lot of the time that there is a break in the personalization is because we all think okay we've got a job we'll put it up on our website and we'll get the right candidate but if there is no personalizations and I think one of the key things that some organizations lack is showing how it is to actually work within their organization. Is that culture feel? If that culture feel is already out there on their website, you candidates will gravitate to it. And it's allowing ca- uh, organizations to actually tell they put out their culture. What is there? Uh, you're talking about the fact that people have been submitting uh, videos, um, part of the applications. If that's the case, then the organization should actually be doing a video of the role and have whoever, the manager, whatever, speaking to people so people can actually see that it's okay. Um, Because I've done it numerous times with Matt um, in the past where Matt said to me, put out a video, get out there, Natalie, and speak. And I was like, you've got to be crazy. Um, But sometimes people just need that nudge and that security that it's okay for them to be themselves. And I think Recite Me allows people to be themselves without any judgment, because if they're looking behind the screen, there is no judgment because they're controlling how they're viewing it, if that makes sense. Sorry, man. It does, and I think you made a really important point there on culture. Um, you know, if you're saying you're an inclusive business and everything else, and Dan, I know this is something that, that we've talked about before as well. Absolutely. If you're saying you're inclusive, you're saying you're everything else, but then your website isn't accessible, which for a lot of people, as Natalie mentioned there, is your first landing point for that business. What does that actually say about, about the company itself? Yeah, exactly that. And we're seeing that certainly in recruitment, we've had a few you know, inquiries come to us and say, we talk about being inclusive, we talk about diverse candidates, and then some of our clients have called us out the fact that our website isn't accessible, and it's happening more and more. Uh, and that's just not, not just with site, you know, it's, it's lots of the different aspects that I, I've discussed on top of that. But it's, yeah, you've got to practice what you preach. If you're going to say, you know, look how inclusive we are, and it picks up on your point there, Karen, and, and yours there, and that's just make sure you're doing it, you know, make sure that you're putting effort into the right places. Absolutely. Marie, I'm going to bring you in. I know you raised your hand to Marie. I'm going to bring you in and then Thomas, I'll come back to you because I'm going to try to couple of points I want to get as many voices as we can heard. So, Marie, over to you. Morning. Uh, I think this is such a fascinating topic. 
Um, Dan, can I ask, if you've got your, say you're a housing association, got mm-hmm. your website, and say you want to make a rent payment that takes you into a different platform, because a lot of housing associations will have something like that, can that recite me still be used in that situation? Yes, but with a couple of caveats. It needs to be, uh, you know, it's implemented by putting JavaScript on, so we need to make sure that the ability to accept JavaScript is there. That That's the main thing. Also, you know, is it a URL that you guys own? Uh, some, especially even in housing, some organizations will own their own URL. Sometimes it will be, you know, providerplatform.com slash housing association name. Yeah. That proves a problem because we we implement per domain. So if it's a widely used domain, it would need to be you know for everyone. Whereas if it's your own personal domain, that keeps it nice and easy. Does that make sense, Marie? Yeah, yeah, that's yes. brilliant. It's Thank it's you. that it's that the wider the digital landscape you have, the the more option there is to put recite me there. You know, we can be on your main website only. We can be everywhere. Uh, it's entirely up to you know what what best fits each individual organization. We always say the wider the digital landscape, you can be be more inclusive on the better. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Worries. It was me. I did the music. <laughs> I might just stop myself saying it, Matt. You realise. Two years of doing this, and I'm the one that does it. I, there's a weird feedback somewhere, but I think it seems to have gone now, but that's brilliant. Uh, yes, Thomas, let me bring you in. Yeah, I, I, guys, I think this, this this is very, very great, and the topic is fantastic. I think, Karen, focusing what what you were saying as well is about how do we find out how to improve the website itself? So everybody's driving culture, engagement, inclusivity, you know, everything that goes around that. So what I think, I'm just going to go on a limb here from from verse one, and I would like to offer everybody who is currently on this platform a two-hour free discovery call to show you how, where you stand in terms of accessibility as you are now, very, very similar to the report that Recite is going to build, but also to give you some advice on where you can go and how you can improve your website because that's that's what we do um as one of the things we do is the websites intranets portals and that kind of stuff but i think you know our, 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 we can have some time with our creative guys and our technical guys and i think to add value and see where your website is at we'll be happy to just do that it'll be completely supplier agnostic it's not going to be us shoving verse one down your throat it'll be a complete Don't want to do too much sales thomas let's give no that's what i'm saying it's, 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 it's a complete blueprint it's a, a supplier agnostic yeah. but i think if you're going to be looking at recite me and you want to look at your website we'll offer you guys a free discovery call at, at no cost but to everybody who's on the school only brilliant yeah. cheers thomas cool. so you can get my details from mass if you want to Cool. Oh, well, I'll ping them around. Thank you. Dan, just a quick question for you in terms of the, the wider piece. Yes. Does this work with an app? Because I know a lot of housing associations at the moment are quite focused on, oh, we want to make an app or something on those lines. And, I mean, we haven't discussed this, but does it work with an app? Is that something you see working? How? Because how, obviously apps are, again, a very different piece of software. Yeah. It's There's two answers to that. So the first one is no. <laughs> um, <laughs> as, you, as you rightly point out there, Matt, you know, websites and apps, Again, this is my own ignorance. I didn't realize there was that much difference. Every web, you know, websites are built on a certain code and certain different structures. Apps can be built in one of infinite ways. You know, I, I don't think there's two apps that are built the same way. Uh, I think it's fair to say. And therefore, building Recite Me for an app would be on a per, you know, would have to build it separately for every app we want to integrate with. Um, so at the moment, no, it's, it's browser based. That, that's, that's how we integrate, that's, that's where we sit. The other side of the coin, and again, it comes back to that technical roadmap, not yet. It's something that we've looked into several times over the last few years. It's something that keeps cropping up. They're keeping, you know, the wonderful world of, you know, even just browsers are updated constantly and always have new filters and always have new things going on. There's there's movements, you know, obviously JavaScript's coming to, to the end of its life and something else is going to take its place, which we're, we're all over at the moment. You know, the the, tech, the the whole digital world changes all the time, and it's it's up to us as providers and any providers. And you know, Thomas, you'll probably back me on that. Is it's up to us to keep on top of what's coming next? What can we innovate? What, what you know? How how is the world changing, and how do we adapt to that? I, I think that's that's the important point. No, brilliant. Like I said, and it was one of those. I, I figured it was always going to be a not yet, but equally thought, well, let's just kind of see where the thought process on it. Natalie, over to you. Sorry, just to let you know, we actually use, we had Recycle Me plugged into our Antra website, but I actually used Recycle Me. From, so a lot of web, a lot of apps are not based on the organization's website. A lot of the time it's based on a back interface 
of their website. So organizations choose what people can see or what they can access. For us, because we knew Recite Me wasn't there yet, what we did is that we translated the pages that we needed our candidates to see on our main page in the background of our website and added it onto our app. So if you've got it plugged into your website already, it's something that you can actually utilize for your app because we did that and we literally added, uh, within seconds. So yeah, so it might not be there, but it is doable. Brilliant. There we are. <laughs> One thing I'll say as well, guys, you know, I've, I've been asked about, you know, marketing and content things, go and have a look at Anchel's socials. It's Anchel's Women's Aid based down in London. That when it comes to, you know, the marketing and the outreach and the pushing, the not just recite me, but accessibility and inclusion in general, have a look at their socials because some of the stuff that Nats was involved with and, and some of the, the, the people that they work with as well has been incredible. Really, really good. Brilliant. I mean, for me, I think one of the important things when we were looking at this topic today was, again, it's just another arm to that kind of bow of, another string to the bow even of, what people are talking about when it comes to inclusivity and diversity and i think it's a conversation that needs to keep on flowing because as, as we've already mentioned a couple of times on the call there are the nine protected characteristics there are ways that we're engaging with people but if the website isn't working itself then then nothing is going to be moving forward and and it's great to see so many people on the on the round table today to come along and kind of go actually you know what for some people, it might be the first time they've really thought about it. Oh, well, we've got a plugin. We can change a couple of languages. You can make it yellow and black. That'll do without necessarily thinking of everything else that everything else that goes into it. Um, has anybody got any kind of final questions they'd like to bring in for Dan or points they'd like to kind of raise just in terms of that inclusivity piece? Even if they've struggled with, I don't know, finding a website inclusive themselves and what they think could be useful. Maybe not. <laughs> I have I have I have a question actually. Oh, this is my yeah, first time. Hello. Thank you. It's my first time uh, attending one of these. But um, my question kind of related to the to the fact that there are other tools out there. Oh, by the way, I work for City of London, um, uh, City of London Corporation. But my my question uh, pertains to the fact there are other tools out there that that can be used in lieu of this sort of in in, in lieu of the the website. Um, what is unique about the website and about the services that, that you provide that they can't really get from other other um, tools such as Google Translate or, um, you know, th there are other translators out there? There are. Uh, I think one of the things that sets it apart is it's not just about translation. It's not just about neurodiversity. It's about everyone with everything. And I think having all, and there's nothing out there that's all the tools in one place that can be used in conjunction with each other. That's one of the things we, we, we've tried to do is bring, you know, because everyone is effective, you know, everyone, their, their, their needs manifest in such different ways. You know, if someone's neurodiverse, they, they can change the appearance, of the, but maybe they also need it to have it read out, or they also need some assistance from the ruler. It, it's it's about the combination of tools. Um, Google Translate, certainly, it's, you'll see in the game where you take something in Google Translate to another language and back to English, and it can be a little bit gibberish. It's quite a binary translation. You know, it's very much word, word by word uh, in a lot of cases. Um, and that's where we like to think we have an advantage over that. But you're right, you know, it's there are tools out there. Even when it comes to different toolbars, there are a couple of other ones out there. There are a couple of different things that different website providers have built. And, you know, Thomas, you mentioned there, your own tools. I would say having tools in general is a good thing. Even if they're a competitive hours, we don't see that as, as a bad thing all the time. It means that the organization is open to the idea. They, they know it's a problem. They know how it affects people to, to whatever extent that might be. And they're doing something about it. And I think, Matt, you know, you mentioned when it comes to this roundtable, this isn't about selling Recite Me, although, you know, if anyone wants to purchase a license, tech, you know, message me after. But it's about raising awareness. It's about driving awareness because over the last few years, the awareness of the these needs that people have has become so much more widely accepted, widely known about. And that's part of what we're trying to do and, and part of the reason you know I come on these roundtables is to to make sure that people are aware that the problems are there and then it's up to the organization to figure out how to to address it does, does that again, answer your question I Zach, think, sorry. yeah Zach I mean so I guess to back up what, what you're pointing there Dan is again it comes back to that idea of culture you know Google Translate is there and that's brilliant and you can plug in or whatever it will be but if you as a culture of your business are, are heavily promoting diversity and inclusion which more and more aren't doing um or at least more and more becoming aware they need to do and yet 
when you go into web search, like, oh, well, it's accessible for X, but it's not accessible for me. You still feel like you're on the outside looking in. And I think this is one of the big things with social housing. And certainly when it came up at, at the housing conference last week, it, it was talked about an awful lot. We had the white paper at the end of 2020 um, that was obviously focused on getting the tenant voice heard, becoming more inclusive for tenants, etc. If your tenants aren't getting the chance to even have a voice, actually we're struggling you know even more than we thought we were because there is definitely that need and, and dan i know this is something you're incredibly passionate about as well just as a kind of final point to wrap up is is that idea of going actually if you haven't if you can't get your voice heard there's never going to be changed yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. if the channels aren't there you know the channels are kind of locked in an inaccessible world so that people can't complain about the inaccessible world then that in itself is is, is a problem it really is. Dan, thank you so much to yourself for coming on today um, and providing some some much, you know, much needed insight, I feel, into a whole other arena. I hope it's been uh, useful for yourself as well. Thank you to everybody who's come along. Um, next week's roundtable, I found out 10 minutes before this meeting, my guest speaker for next week has dropped out. So uh, I'm in the process of sorting out a backup there, but that's absolutely fine. That's the nature of the business. Um, so looking forward to seeing everybody at next Tuesday. Please do join the Social Housing Roundtable LinkedIn group. That's where all the updates and information come through, but it's also where the recording of today's, uh, today's roundtable will be. So do jump on there. And if there are any topics you'd like to see coming up, please let me know because I'm always willing to open this up to as many voices as we can. Dan, thank you very much again. Thank you everybody for coming. I look forward to seeing you all at the next event. Cheers. Thank Thanks, you everyone. Cheers pleasure. guys. Well done, Matt, Dan. Thank Thanks, Matt. Cheers. Cheers thank guys. You.